<laughs> so the Economist had an article uh, recently on the demographic tragedy facing Russia today. And here are some highlights of the story. Over the last three years, Russia, which has a population of about 145 million, has lost more than uh, 2 million uh, people, more than it normally would have due to the war and migration. The life expectancy of males age 15 fell by almost five years and is now at the same level as a 15-year-old in Haiti. The number of Russians born in April of 2022 was no higher than it had been in the months of Hitler's occupation. Women now outnumber men by at least 10 million due to the war. Um, they've lost about 100 to 200,000 uh, uh, people. And then another, due to the war, another 500,000 to a million, uh, mostly young educated people have fled the nation uh, over the last couple of years as well. And whenever you have such dramatic changes in a short period, you're really placing significant burdens on a shrinking and ailing population. So why do demographics matter? Well, there's two keys to growing GDP. One is population growth and the other is productivity growth. Both ironically have been challenged the past few years. Surprisingly, with all the advances in technology uh, that we've seen, we haven't seen the uh, productivity has actually been down over the last couple of years, but we expect a big rebound to be coming. Um, I think the, uh, the issue that a lot of countries are facing, and this is not just a Russian issue, as you'll see, this is a global issue, this demographic challenge. Um, I think there's two real important challenges I wanna to touch on. Um, one is the changes occurring the last few years uh, globally on a, on a world level, but really focus on some of the leading nations. And then I wanna discuss some of the implications of this on uh, policy issues. But before we get into that, I wanted to share what a difference a uh, few years makes, not just in demographics, but in yields. And when you go back to where we are now and back to 07, 08, we've actually moved back to where we were in a more normal environment in rates. And this has been a difficult adjustment and people are worried about what does this all mean? Um, I think we're really just moving back into a mode where, um, so what you're seeing now is we've moved back to uh, where we were pre the uh, financial crisis. And when you remember, we've had a major shift from the post-financial crisis, zero and negative interest rates, which PIMCO really thoughtfully named uh, the new normal, which it was for uh, most of the last decade. We're now moving back to the old normal uh, where you're in a, a bit of a non-zero uh, rate environment. Um, and this has big implications as, and has had big implications for uh, asset allocation and asset values. So this is to me one of the biggest changes that we're still adjusting to. And I think you have to realize that we're going to be in a uh, more normal rate environment than we've, uh, the, the old environment that we've been in. And this is gonna be something that um, we should expect the Fed, the market's coming back to the Fed now. Um, the Fed's probably not gonna have too many uh, rate cuts this year, if any. Um, and the market was expecting two. Now I think they're only expecting one. I think after tomorrow, they should probably be expecting none, but I wouldn't make too much of what happens the next day or two with rates. Just know that we're really shifting back to a higher level of interest rates. But we've also seen some other changes that are positive in the last couple of years. And we had this with the pandemic and then with the war, we had a big spike in labor shortages. And this is a chart showing labor shortages of Russell 3000 companies. And you saw the spike last October, but the mentioning of labor shortages has come down significantly. I think this easing of the labor market conditions will take some of the inflationary pressures off, but it won't move the Fed out of a mode where they're still fighting inflation. It just eases some of the problems that businesses are facing and will take some of the pressures off of wages. So I just wanted to share those two charts because I think they both have big implications for what's on people's minds about rates and inflation and when can you feel that if rates are peaking, when, when do you feel confident that you'll be able to understand valuations better going forward? I think we're in getting closer to the level where the Fed will raise rates for a couple more uh, times and then let quantitative tightening do the work for them as they reduce their balance sheet. But that's my uh, suspicion where we are right now. And I think that's what we have as our highest probability outcome. 
So jumping to population, this is a chart that goes back to uh, 1700 and shows back then we had about 600 million uh, people in the world. Population growth rate, the annual growth rate peaked in 1968 at about 2.1%. And when you look going back forward to uh, 2021, you look out there, we're gonna have a population of about uh, 10.9 billion people, but the growth rate uh, of the population will be at 0.1% a really low rate, and we need to uh, really focus on that because it's gonna have significant challenges for a global economy and for country's economy and really has policy issues that you have to address now to deal with some of the challenges that are coming. This is just a different look at the uh, population growth both on a world basis uh, and then by regions. And quite frankly, as you move out past 2060, 2080, there's no spot to hide in the world where populations aren't going to be in a flattening or not growing or declining level. And in some cases, the declines are going to be pretty significant. So just something to keep in mind as you're thinking about markets and where you're going, uh, what looks like it's a great opportunity in the near term may be a tougher one for the longer term. Um, here's just the population by seg age groups and segment. And one of the things to keep an eye on, as you can see, as you move out, the 25 to 64 year old, which is the working population group, starts to flatten out as you get to 2040, 2050, 2060, but the under 25 starts to decline and even worse, the 65 plus starts to accelerate up at that period. And again, the backfill from the under 50 and under five is not there to provide support. This is gonna put great strains on governments and on an elderly system. Uh, that is not really set up for great social safety nets going forward and bigger health care issues. This is just a different slice on population by age. And, you know, what you take away from this is the working age population is not growing. The people that are on support or uh, particularly in the elderly are growing and the back bill is not coming again. So shifting gears to three leading nations, uh, India, China and Japan and their population growth rates. And what you can see here in the green, you have India, which is, uh, as you go out to uh, 2022, they're growing at about, you know, a one and a half uh, percent, one percent growth rate, where the population growth rates of China is flattened out and Japan has been negative. These are bad signs for nations that are leading nations. And keep in mind, this is the second largest economy with China, third largest with Japan, and fifth largest with India now. Uh, so you're really looking at um, big challenges going on. And why is this an issue economically and policy-wise is goes to the uh, dependency ratios, which is how many people in the world are uh, under age 15 and over age 65 that are really being supported by the working people from ages 15 to 64. And what you saw when the Brick nations started to take off and you started to see big population growth out of those areas, you started to see a decline in the dependency ratios. But now as we move forward, you start to see that pick up again. So looking at that on a on a individual country level basis, again with Japan, you can see how Japan is really ratcheting up to where 80% of the population is going to be dependent on 20% of the working people. That's a tough math. You see in India, it's moving in a more positive direction. And in China, it's also sloping up. These are not great, great looking numbers for nations. And when you look at the median age, how rapidly uh, Japan is aging and China is aging relative to the rest of the world. Edgar Denny has called these two nations the world's lar uh, largest nursing homes. And they're well on their way to that when you look at these uh, median ages. So uh, that's a big issue. Uh, that these countries are facing and has big policy issues. So I want to just touch on Japan and, uh, and China at a glance and then talk about some of the policy implications. So Japan's basically 125 million people. Last year, uh, they had under 800,000 births, um, which is less than half of what it was in 1982. And it was less than half of the amount of deaths that they've had. So their replacement rate is well below. And when you look at their fertility rate, 
a 1.3, it's well below the 2.1 that's needed to maintain your population. So they're in a population decline. And you know, one out of every 1,500 people are uh, going to live to be 100. Um, but their population has been in decline really since the late 80s. And that's putting a lot of strain on the system. Uh, so much so that uh, when you think about who's stuck holding the, holding the bill with this, it's going to be the few people that are in the working system supporting all the people that are out of the workforce system. So this is a real challenge for Japan, um, but it's also a challenge for China. You look at a population of 1.4 billion, it was down almost 800,000, 850,000 people from 2021. Their births are under 10 million. Their deaths are over 10 million. Their fertility rate is low. Um, and elderly make up one fifth of the country's population. But by 2050, they're forecast to have their population decline by 100 million. And by 2020, by 2100, by 600 million people. So this is part of the strain that you're starting to see on the system that is creating some challenges and policy issues that the government's going to have to deal with. Because while it feels like these are short-term problems or longer-term problems, they're issues that are really facing these nations right now. And it's creating some, some real challenges. But it's not just there. The rest of the world has these issues as well. Europe is, uh, is an aging population as well. Birth rates are down there. Migration policies or immigration policies are under pressure. Um, and the areas that's seeing the biggest population growth, countries like Nigeria, also have to worry about their systems and can they support the population growth and will they lose some of their best talent to other areas? So let's switch gears for a minute and think about what can nations do to deal with the challenges. I think one of the key things is to obviously focus on innovation. You have to improve productivity to deal with it. You're gonna have fewer people in the labor force supporting more people. Um, so you're gonna to have to really focus on productivity. And I think while we've had the decline the last couple of years, you're going to see an acceleration in productivity going forward um, that it will help nations, but it'll help those that uh, most embrace innovation and those that have a national plan to uh, innovate and deal with the problems that they're working on and really require uh, public-private partnerships to do that. I think second, you're gonna to have to really focus on immigration. When you think about China and Japan, their immigration policies are, it's not actually a first destination and a welcoming place for immigrants to have enough uh, people in their own countries to deal with, but they're going to have to really focus on changing their immigration policies. And for the US, we have to re-embrace the immigration policies that drove our strength throughout our history um, because it is a key driver of growth um, and economic strength. Um, that's something that nations are going to have to come to grips with and really refine their immigration policies to deal with the issues that they're facing. I think healthcare is going to continue to improve, but as life expectancies lengthen, you need to improve the quality of healthcare, have people working in the system longer and be more productive. Um, and that, that would allow people to retire later in life because the bills coming due for people uh, as they get older are high. And that's something we're going to have to continue to ex extend the uh, time in the workforce to uh, help offset some of the demographic cliffs that countries are facing. I think education and vocational training is another area because not only do you have the issues with people focusing on their initial work and is co cost of education too high and all that, we're dealing with those issues, but you're going to have multiple careers and that requires learning new skills at different stages in your life. Um, and vocational training programs, which we've gotten away from in the U.S., uh, much more popular in other nations, are a key element to getting people the skills they need that aren't being taught in universities, like tool and die skills and other uh, vocational skills that can make a lot of money for people, um, but we're not promoting the education of them. And then there's no social safety nets in a lot of the places around the world. Pension systems were not designed to support these age dependency ratios and high worker ratios and people living as long as they are in retirement. When you think about the social security system, it was started, I think the life expectancy was only a few years older than 65. So you weren't expecting people to retire and live long on the system. And now you're having people living into their you know, late 80s and 90s, and that's actually creating a lot of strain. So countries have to rethink their social security programs, their social safety nets, to help support the system against some very difficult demographic cliffs. So 
I'm going to stop there, Mark, open it up for comments and uh, discussion. So I just had a quick question on, on health care being as a percentage of GDP and just cost for the average consumer. Do you, what, what gives you hope among your portfolio that we're going to lower those costs? And, and I, think you, I think there are a number of, if you look at what's going on in the biotech area, there's real, there's real stuff going on. And we use a company we like in the portfolio called Ascendus that we own. They've actually, they take, um, uh, what are their treatments is for human growth hormones. So kids getting human growth hormones from time they're 12 or 13 to 16 take shots every day right now. What you can do with that, um, with, with what Ascendus is doing is you get one shot a week, has the same efficacy as seven shots, improves the quality of care, lowers the cost and has the better results. That's just one example of the many things we could be doing. If we clean up the record keeping in our healthcare system, you'll have much lower costs. You'll be able to have greater efficacy in the uh, treatments and fewer problems and uh, fewer waste in, in the system as well. So I think there are a number of things that are going on that can help uh, exoskeletons like we've looked at allow people to work in the labor force longer with lower strain and better, better quality health, even for younger people who don't need the exoskeletons. If you're working in a Amazon warehouse and you're working with that, it takes massive strain off your system and gives you a better outcome. So I think there are a number of things that can be done um, in how we're doing it that that will will help uh, as well. So I'll stop there. And Joel has some interesting things and, in the chat. And Henry, yeah, thanks, Joel. Henry, you have a question? Yeah, I do. Thanks, Mark. Um, thanks, Stephen. Very interesting study and statistics. So you know, the decline in population growth, it's actually been a trend, right? So it's not like that just happened overnight. But with that said, the world that we're living in is very interesting. You, you touched upon uh, some of the really key interesting stuff. But one thing, not really touched upon, but it's actually, I think it's going to play out also over time is the, the substitute of mas machines, robotics, mm -hmm. right? So historically, yep. you know, let's say 100 years ago, 200 years ago, however long that is, you might need people who have a lot of babies, a lot of kids. Because this has a percentage. People have a lot. Of, people have a lot of kits or, or family members. Andrew Randack, can I stay on mute? Keep going. Sorry, Henry. No worries. I'm going to wait for him to do one more time before I start. How's that? <laughs> no, I'm just joking. Yeah, he'll, okay. he'll, he'll do it. So don't. I, I don't like to chime on people, but you know. But anyway. Okay. Okay. But let, I'll continue. So uh, going back hundred years ago, uh, you know, people have a lot of kids because they need people to work on the farms, right? Human yeah. labor. Right? But now let's say just focus on agriculture as an argument. It can be spread across a lot of different economies. Historically, let's say if you need 100 people to work on farms, now maybe you need 10, right? You got the all the agricultural tools, even you use a drones, right? You know, for watering the plants, right? Uh, fertilizers, so on and so forth. Robotics uh, as a substitute to human labor in a manufacturing plants. While this is a very high level general argument, what do you see in terms of the introduction of robotics machines, replacing some of the human labor, encountering low population growth? What are your general thoughts on that? Thank you. I think, I think it's gonna be one of the elements that helps deal with the workforce issues, but and then you have to figure out how you're gonna tax robots so that you get the payments into the system so that we can afford to have all the people that aren't working supported because you have bigger elements that aren't in the system creating, uh, that are taking benefits out of the system, but aren't paying into the system. So I think that's one of the elements that you have to figure out is how do you offset, how do you get the cost to the, the taxes and the tax revenues to cover the benefits that you have to give to the population when they're not paying into the system as, uh, in taxes the same way. So I think it's going to impact tax policy. I think it does offset some of the labor problems but we've seen historically that that innovation creates new opportunities too, and you'll need more people for those new opportunities. So I think there's a balance between the two. Um, but, it'll help on one hand, but you'll still not replace everything. But on the maybe other. I'm thinking about it wrong. As part of it, you're paying into the system in order to support those people later uh, or in general, but we're not trying to support a robot later. Are we, no, are but we, you're gonna, are we you apple, have a timing issue. There? You have a timing issue. We're going to run out of money in our Social Security Medicare systems right now in 10 years, and the Highway Trust Fund is going to run out. 
if you don't have people working in the system paying in, but they're on the other side taking benefits out of the system, Social Security and Medicare and the like, how do you cover those costs? So I think that's one of the issues right, right. we're going to have to figure out policy around. So a little, little, little different than I was thinking about. Okay, um, Joel, Adam, and Michael. Yeah, I just wanted to say that healthcare becomes so incredibly important, and we need people living long, healthy lives and having a good health span as opposed to a lifespan. That way, you know, you're not just going to, you know, wring your hands at 65, wrap everything up and stop contributing. If you're healthy enough, you're going to want to keep working. You're going to work in different you're going to have a new career. You're going to find different ways to give back. I mean, I think the way things are going right now uh, with the state of individual health throughout the world and obesity and all the issues that's causing, if we don't fix that or work on that in some way to help people prevent uh, disease and everything else, yeah, th then, then we're in trouble. But if we can get people to change habits and, and lead fulfilling lives, longer lives, maybe we'll be okay. I'll stop there. Adam, thanks, Sean. Yeah, um, I'll, I'll start my question with a statement, actually. I did, this seems like fantastic opportunity. I, I don't see the downside to this. We have to change, that's all. And in those changes, there's opportunity. Outside of healthcare, what are the other industries where 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 there are opportunities to to uh, capitalize on these changes? That's my question. Clearly, clearly tech and and the industrial sector are both going to be beneficiaries of it. You know, those are two right off the bat that that win. Yeah. Would agree with that. Zer I know, Zaren, you want to speak, but... Yes, very quick. And I think maybe financial industry as well, because already I'm in touch, for example, there was a lady who's, it's more female oriented, but it applies to everybody that there will not be enough money for sure. And that you need to, you know, understand compounding effect. You need to uh, invest a little bit. Maybe the financial industry will come up with creative solutions to set aside something differently and also i think yeah work structures will change it will be also more digital and passive income streams that will be established uh, where people have done prior work yeah, the other yeah. issue that that goes back to the robotics question is do, do you start to see more guaranteed income programs initiated which then have to be paid for as well if people aren't having the job opportunities. I'd, I'd like to make one other comment um, following up on what oh. Joel was saying in terms of people working longer and um, having to change, learn new, new skills and careers. And that's going to require change in society and the attitude. And that's not, that's not a bad thing necessarily. Well, if it's a healthful life. Um... Exactly. Exactly. Right. It's not just life. That's a good point. It's My, quality. My, Michael? Uh, so um, a comment, then a question for Stephen. So when the first pension scheme came out, it was under Bismarck in Germany. And 65 was picked because most people didn't live beyond 65. <laughs> um, as you had mentioned, people are living longer today. But it's still, retirement is still in the 65 range in the US, 62 in France, and the protests about it going to 64. Oh, on, a, on a four day work week. Yeah. And uh, a lot of countries, and, I, and I'm looking specifically, specifically in the US, have moved very slowly to address these issues. I mean, there's a lot of things that could be done, but the politicians tend to wait until it's truly a crisis before they make a move. Yeah, it's it's but, it's a great it's a great point you're bringing up because the the Japanese and Chinese demographic issue is not 
news this week. It's been going on for quite some time. But yeah. until you have a gun to your head, politicians don't usually react. So it's a super easy issue to kick the can down the road, right, Steve, from a, from a political legislative perspective. It's like, well, this won't really be hair on fire for, you know, X number of years. I won't be in office by then. So, you know, let, let's focus on something that's more immediate uh, gratification yep. for my constituency. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's a real issue for pension oh. plans. No. So, um, by the way, hearing your voice, Mark, uh, you uh, need, where's Bij? He, uh, Bij and you need to meet to talk about yachts in Miami. All right. <laughs> well, I want him to have Bij's yacht with you in Miami next year. So we'll talk about that. 100%. Later. 100%. We're in. We're in. I love it. Consider it uh, done. The, well, the Mark article. Cuban, actually, Mark, speaking of health, lowering health costs, Mark Cuban with, uh, you know, cost plus. But unless we get some, you know, partnering with him on his yacht, uh, Bij has one. So we've got Mark, Bill, Eugene, quickly, um, go for it. I just, this whole conversation about robotics and, you know, generative AI is happening out there. You know, frame it with a pessimistic, optimistic framework. I'm very optimistic that we'll transition through this and we're going to still need more labor. You know, we've digitized the farm. We, 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 we've, uh, the farm economy has been, been automated, the manufacturing economy hasn't been automated. You know, we've spent 20 years of digitization of the service economy, and that's still be, with mostly a focus now on automation, and we still don't have enough people. Uh, the pessimistic side of me, though, so I, so I don't think it's going to eliminate the need for people. I think we'll find other uses for them, and that gets me to the pessimistic side is how do we manage that transition? Because we've managed the former transitions very poorly, you know, from the automation of the farm, automation of the factory, and automation, now, now we're automating knowledge work. Uh, you know, it's, I'm just pessimistic that we'll handle that transition well because we've handled it poorly in the past. Uh, you're, so, you're, you're, there's also an ethics point on this whole, um, uh, to, to both sides, to different sides, of, including on generative AI. We, we need to be more thoughtful about all these, because you know, the robber barons are, of a different sort today. Um, so, uh, sorry, Mark, you wanted to say something quickly? Yeah, I was, I was just, I mean, I think that the other Mark, Mark White just raised great questions and, and I have at least a partial answer. <laughs> and I think it's incumbent on the folks like us that are on this call, because as we just established, we can't leave it or hope to leave it to the government to institute those programs. So what am I, what am I talking about specifically? I think private enterprise, independent investors, family offices, in conjunction with the investments that we make in the industry, and, and I'll, I'll point to one that that um, my uh, family office and my partners are invested in and advisors to, it's a company called Miso Robotics, which is um, using uh, uh, robotics for quick serve restaurants and fast food. And part of what we're doing is trying to make sure through uh, social parts of the business we're not eliminating jobs. We're we're upscaling those jobs. So instead of people working, you know, as fry cooks, they can actually work more front of the house than back of the house. So I think programs like that, and and insisting as investors that if we're going to allocate to this fast-growing robotics space, that the companies that we invest in have programs like that to make sure that we're not eliminating jobs. We're actually improving the condition of people that are in those lower paying jobs. Yeah, fair enough. 